Sometimes when I'm thinking about us Before we got lost and we parted Back to back we would carry on then We'd do anything for what we started But this time we could break Welcome, 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 everybody, to the FPV News. Uh, it's good to be here with you, Blunty. Yeah, it's good to be here yeah. on a Tuesday, back for the news, two weeks in Tuesday. a row. Two weeks yeah. in a row? Oh, my gosh. Wow. The, the, nothing could have happened in the last week to uh, be worth reporting on. We should just, I mean, is there is there even enough news in a week to make it worth doing this? <laughs> uh, barely, but we are. we do have a show for you today. Oh, I expected, I was hoping you would sell it more. Oh, there's so much. It's not, it's, it's not really. That's not really your role. Nothing not exciting. Next week will be the big, good, big news because the DJI release. Because the that's DJI out release. On the 11th. What could yeah. possibly be releasing? <laughs> New DJI stuff. How much of yeah. this do I have to show mm. before I violated the NDA? Is this violating the NDA? <laughs> Is this violating the NDA? <laughs> oh, no, no, was... let's not find out. <laughs> you'll, you'll never know. You'll never know. Uh-huh. I think the Was mic... it a bit? Oh, my mic stand is cracking after all these years. I was like, my mic's a little loose. My, uh, my. Let's hope it doesn't break before I, I can't touch my mic again. It's, it's cracking. Yeah, I don't. You have to 3D print a bracket. Okay. Um, oh, we do have news for you guys. Uh, in fact, we're going to start with some public service announcements. Yeah, we've got a PSA today. Sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't. Today seemed like a pretty decent one to let you know about. This is not going to be like a, uh, this isn't like a critical danger, but this is a like, hey, you should be aware of how this works. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so we'll just tell you. So Radio Master Radios and possibly other radios, but in, in testing, uh, a Boxer and I believe a TX16S are the two we're looking at here. Um, if you're charging on USB for your mm -hmm. battery, uh, it's, yeah. not, it's not balancing it. So yeah. you should be aware that it's not balancing it. Here in the first image, you can see 4.34 on one cell and 3.96 on the second cell. So obviously, that's not balanced. 
Oh my god! I, um, clicked, I, I, I clicked away by accident. I hit right arrow, meaning to go to the next image. There we go. Let's do it. Let's um, continue. Yeah, and on this other one, um, we've got a couple cells here that are four point oh seven and three point three one. Um, yeah. So you should know that these aren't getting balanced by your by your by your uh, radio. Maybe you should yeah. unplug these and every now and then balance them or something, or just keep an eye on them and understand that they're not going to be balanced. And I have to say. This is one of those things where when someone brought it up and was sort of shocked and upset, I was like, did you did did, you, did people not know this? And I don't mean that. I don't mean to be like, well, I'm so smart. I already knew this. But I tested this uh, when I first I don't know when during the, reviewing one of these radios. And it's pretty common. Like if you have, you know, nickel cadmium batteries or something that you don't balance them, they kind of just get charged up and they just charge up. And it's obviously different with lithium batteries. Um for the record, I, I tested mine before we started the show, and mine are at like 3.8 and 3.79. They're like pretty well balanced. And that's what you kind of would expect because the you would expect the internal resistance of the cells to be pretty well matched, and you would expect that it's not a very high load. Like the higher the current you're pulling from the battery, the more out of balance they will get due to the internal resistance. So since this is relatively low load, mine are staying relatively well balanced. But... As you said, if you didn't know this, I mean, the situation where one of the batteries was at like 433, you know, 435, like that's not, oh my God, my battery's going to blow up, but that's not like ideal. And you would want to balance those or figure out why it's getting out of balance and maybe get a new battery. I don't know. Um, but not everybody is going to experience this. Some of them will just happen to stay balanced and that's okay too. Yeah. So yeah, just a kind of a thing you should know and uh, be aware of. So, yeah. yeah, you could, as uh, as Xscape points out in the Discord, you could avoid this issue by always using an external charger. But then I just like to plug USB in because I'm fundamentally a lazy person. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. Oh, Fabio, good to see you. Why aren't you working on that video? Work on the video, Fabio. Don't be jacking around in the cut in the uh, no. He was like, I'll work tonight, I promise. And I was like, damn right. Yeah. All right, All right, what's next? <laughs> next up is we want to share this uh, website with you, prowhooper.com slash all tricks. And this is a Tyrant FPV has put together a little um, trictionary of all kinds of different tricks. Uh, oh, my gosh. With little gifs or gifs. With little gift gifs of the actual moves, not just that's okay. Now, Tyrant uh, sent me this link and was like, hey, you should check this out. And me being me, I was like, oh, I'll get to it. And then I didn't get to it. And that's why this is why I will always keep doing the news because I'm so glad we're to have seen this. It's really cool. Yeah, so this is, I believe, 80 tricks are here, um, and then you can click into each of them, and it gives you a little description of, like, what you're doing during it. It's not like a trick guide, but it is like a... No, hey, it's a trictionary. And then you can click on Vanny Roll, and you can see the GIF, and then you can scroll down and see a description of what you're doing to do a Vanny Roll. That's... This is so much work. I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed, Tyrant. Uh, man. Man. What is this? Show me the huge update. Are these just new tricks? Categories? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This, I, can I sponsor this? Maverick or Tyrant, Tyrant, Tyrant. Can I sponsor this? Because you need to keep doing this. Like, you know, pay for your hosting or something. This is really cool, dude. This is really, what's going on with the power split? Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. I want to see this keep getting, uh, you know, fleshed out, you know, and people keep adding things. That's very cool. A donkey loop. I've never even heard of that. What's a donkey loop? Yeah, and all these uh, tricks also, if you click into them, have like point totals. And that's for Tyrant's Pro Whooper series that we've talked about uh, previously to this. So that's sort of Ooh. the basis for a lot of this stuff. Maverick loop. Okay, we do a loop, then we do a flick back, yaw spin 360, and back around. Oh, nice. I call that a flick back. 
but we don't. I guess you're the official name guy now. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, Tyrant, reach out to me. I would love to throw. Uh, you know, I don't want to make it all about the money, but like I know that things cost money and time is valuable, and I would love to see you be able to keep this going and have it grow and grow and become more and more of a resource. That's freaking cool. That's freaking cool. Very cool. Um. Would be great if, uh, you know, what would be really great would be if there was some way for people to, ooh, maybe you could do it with YouTube timestamps for people to link to examples of the tricks found in the wild. And, and you wouldn't want to have to make tyrant, make gifs of all of them, but what maybe what, maybe what you and tyrant I'm throwing, I'm not mean to like, uh, you're like, Hey, I got this dude. I get it. The first thing I do when I see your project is start thinking of ways that I want you to change it. But wouldn't it be interesting if like for every one of those tricks, the community could submit links to examples of the trick in a freestyle video? I don't know. Somebody would have to check it out and make sure it was valid, but that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, oh, do we have a new, are we adding something to the, is that in the video description? Uh, yeah. What you just added? No, I'm just, nope. Okay, real quick, I'm going to get it added. Uh, uh, this one also changed, so, I'm, okay. yeah. I was trying not to interrupt days. you, so. Oh, no okay. worries. I'm happy to interrupt the show. <laughs> I can, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> we definitely have two different styles of presenting live videos, you know. You're just like, fuck it, let's talk about it. Let's let's stop it. Let's let's yeah. do it back and forth. Let's do the dead air. Who cares? And then I'm always like uh, trying to avoid that stuff and like trying to change stuff in the background and make it all smooth, you know. It's a yeah. two yeah. different styles. Yep, yep. Yep. <laughs> I like the mix. I, I like the I like the mix though. It's fine. We can do okay. It. All right. <laughs> Here you go. You do it. Okay, next up uh, is an open source lap timer solution, which I thought was pretty freaking cool. Um, and this will be neat if we see uh, people come out with, you know, we've already seen some offers on Discord for people to build these for people, but, you know, companies could also release these for sale um, and things. But yeah, this is basically an open source lap timer solution. Phobos has been a long term developer on Express LRS, um, I believe some beta flight stuff. Um, and yeah, now they've built this whole lap timing solution that's all kind of built together and ready to go. It uses parts of the code from Rotor Hazard and Express LRS. Um, yeah, and it lets you use a ESP32 board and RX5808 and uh, set up a lap timer. So pretty and, cool. And, and I, I mean, like some people watching this will be thinking, whatever, there's lots of open source lap timers out there. Why is this one special or different? And there's there's a little bit of truth to that, but like, if you look at something like Rotor Hazard, it's like, it's fairly involved to set up a Rotor Hazard lap timer. Even if you build the little single node one with the ESP32, and the hardware requirements are not too onerous, the software setup you know is is fairly like I, my setup video is like 45 minutes, and only like 10 of 12 of that is actually the hardware, and the rest is all the software. Um, so having like a nice, small, integrated, free, and relatively easy to set up situation, uh, very, very nice. I would say not just that, but open source. So like, I don't think any other solution we've had that you could build on an ESP32 and an RX50808 has been open source. I think they've all been like closed source releases or hmm. stuff that hasn't really had any development. And this is an hmm. hopefully actively developed open right. source solution that can fit on an RX5808. Yeah. Uh, based on some modern code. So Yeah. Know, well that that's it. There's cool. there's been some open source ones that are old and not really developed. And there right. are some closed source ones that are free but closed source. So uh very, very cool. And if you're looking for a inexpensive, relatively easy to build and relatively easy to use lap timer, uh kudos to uh Phobos for putting this out there. I can't help but notice like if I look at the AI, the UI like this stuff, okay, fine, whatever. But I, then we got to this part. This looks just like Rotor Hazard. That can't be a coincidence, right? Like, is there no, a using... code from Rotor yeah. Hazard? Yeah, it's using code from Rotor Hazard and Express LRS to do stuff. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Does that mean Does that mean Rotor Hazard's open source? Is Rotor Hazard open source? I yes. thought it was. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, yeah, Edoc points out Chorus 32 was another one that was put out there, it was open source, but this is this is way simpler. So anyway, check it out. Evaluate it. If you decide to build one, more power to you. Uh, if you're going to race yeah. and you don't have a lap timer, if you're just using a stopwatch or you're just using your DVR, having a lap timer so you know how fast that lap slap was. And like, it's so, so valuable. Like you, you can't, I don't want to say you can't get good at racing without a lap timer, but boy, it'd be like trying to, you know, race without a stopwatch, you know? So. Yeah, it definitely, yeah, it improves the entire experience. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so then we've got the, wait, what am I doing? I'm going to go here and I'm going to, there we go. Boom. Good to go. All right. Um, so uh, the next thing we've got here is from Hydra. Oh, uh, we all Clifton. know a lot. Most of us know Dominic Clifton, Hydra. Mm -hmm. um, and he has released a, a piece of code for ExpressLRS uh, that's in draft right now that is an IR-based lap timing system transponder. Hmm. Um, so it basically sets up a project inside of ExpressLRS that allows uh, IR lap timing stuff to happen and I'll, I'll so here's the thing before we had lap timers based on the video transmitter we had ir ir based lap timers and you would get to a race and they would like tell you what frequency or what your what your code was supposed to be for your and you would actually put in your flight controller you would solder an infrared LED to your flight controller, and in the CLI, you would put some code that was like what it was going to blah, 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 and identify you. And then there would be an IR sensor at the start finish gate that picked up when you passed through. And as far as I can tell, it was a giant pain in the ass, and everyone abandoned it as soon as we had video transmitter based lap timing. As far as I can tell, video transmitter based lap timing is accurate. It uses something that you already have on your aircraft. Why Why are we going backwards? I guess is my question. That's a question for Hydra. I, I cannot tell you. Oh, well, sometimes he's here, but not today. Hydra, why are we going backwards? I guess one advantage of the IR transponders is you don't have to do any shenanigans with the video transmitter signal strength thresholds. Like tweaking those right. thresholds to get the timing accurate can be a pain. And the more pilots you have, the more of a pain it is. But it just seems like we've abandoned this and we're not doing this anymore. So why are, why are we, I guess it's his baby, his pet project. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Can't tell you. Okay. But we at least wanted to share that, uh, yeah, he was doing this because it seems interesting. And I haven't seen anybody do something like this in a long time. So maybe there is demand or maybe he's just doing it because it's something he thought was interesting. Yeah, well, he does do interesting things. Well, anyway, there you go. Now it's built into the ExpressLRS receiver instead of being built into the flight controller. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, cool. All right. I won't. I won't badmouth something hydrogen. He's done so much for us that that has been super useful. If he wants to do one oddball project that has no actual application, then I'll. I won't badmouth it too much. <laughs> All right. Next up, we've got I'm a killing, video that's I'm killing you. That, that was recently released, but uh, <laughs> is was recorded a while back. Is uh, this video from Mike on this Rose? Episode. We released on Mike Rose channel. Yeah, and, and uh, this is from a show that used to air, uh, but I don't think this one ever aired. I dug through the episodes and I could not find this episode unless it's a tiny segment from one. It's yeah. from a show called Somebody's Got to Do It, mm -hmm. um, and Mike Rose goes to a drone race. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, I've watched this a little while back and was pretty impressed with it uh, in terms of like getting drone racing, getting attention uh, from like mass media. We've got our good friend, Jesse Perkins. Yes. Uh, here with Mike. Jesse looking very dapper. What a, what a handsome man. Jeez. I mean, I want to be in whatever hobby this guy's in. I am not playing this because I fear that we'll get a copy strike from Mike if we play it. And I don't want that. Mike seems like a good guy. Maybe he'd let it slide. But I'm, I would love for you guys to go watch this. It's linked in the video description below. They, uh, they get my... What a great coat. Jesse. Oh, I'm sorry. What a great coat. <laughs> 
Um, can you get Mike a tiny whoop? I mean, I would have started him on the simulator, but that's not good television. They get him on a tiny whoop. There we go. FPV for the masses, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a hobby that everybody wants to be in. <laughs> they get him on a tiny whoop. He flies for a little while. And, uh, yeah. And somehow this didn't make it onto television. Go figure. <laughs> Loses his quad in the woods. Everybody has a good time. Yeah, absolutely. It's a cool video. Check it out. Uh, it's nice to see <laughs> FPV getting discovered by people, you know? Indeed. Indeed. Um, links in the video description, by the way. I wonder when that was recorded. Released a month ago. When was it recorded? Never before seen episode. Yeah. I was trying to date it by the like the hardware they were using, but it was hard yeah. to tell. I don't know if Jesse actually said. I know he was commenting about it, but I don't know if he said when it was recorded. Hmm. Next up. Yeah, next up we've got uh, flow frames. We wanted to let you know about this. A while back we looked at another um, AI tool um, Topaz video AI that does a mm -hmm. similar project, but Topaz actually AIs the image, uh, like builds new images and things. Um, but it also has an interpolation feature, which sometimes is good and sometimes it's not, especially after using it a lot more. I'll say that mm -hmm. there's definitely some issues with interpolation on, uh, Topaz. So you yeah. can kind of up, do your AI stuff with Topaz at the same frame rate and then, or just take your normal footage and then move it over to flow frames, which is a free program. Um, and this is a open source program that basically does builds oh. on Patreon for charging or releases, you know, the, basically the newest free version comes on itch.io for free, or we've linked the GitHub and you can go build the latest version if you're keen on, you know, knowing how to build stuff off of GitHub. So there's yeah. definitely different options, but this is all open source. Um, it basically lets you interpolate extra frames into things. So change 30 to 60 and things like that um, by using AI to interpolate the in-between frames. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, I know they're only going to show the best examples here, but like that's pretty good. And I'll tell you why I think this would be useful uh, for me personally. Like I release all my content at 30 FPS. I, I actually find too many frames to be upsetting <laughs> when i get a television and it's got that frame interpolation 120 fps smooth motion thing uh, oh, oh i yeah, cannot so turn it off fast enough and yeah. and uh my uh, my wife is like uh, she kind of gets it because she also she's about my age but like my son has no idea what i'm talking about he literally can't see it and uh so I'm fine with 30 FPS is what I'm saying. But there are a lot of times when I want to stretch footage and slow it down. And if you've recorded it at 30 FPS and then you slow it down to 2x speed or half speed, now it's only 15 FPS and it's like obviously no good. I can think of many times when I've been editing a video and wished I had twice the frame rate and maybe something like this could have really helped me out. Yeah. Certainly at least worth a shot because it is free and you can go download it from itch.io for free. So I yeah. definitely think it's worth giving a try, you know, seeing how long it takes on your computer and, and how it works for you. So Awesome. Yeah, definitely check it out if it's free. Jeez. Um, Ghost Branch says, I've been a patron of his for around 14 months. Sadly, not a single update to the patron version of the software since then, but a great tool. There you go. Yeah, there's no, there's been no open source development as far as I know. So that's why like the patron builds, or maybe that's not why, but like a lot of this code has been updated three years, four years last year. The patron is just builds of the open source code that he maintains for people. So I uh, think that's part of it. The patron build is has the, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. All right. Very, very cool. Well, if you're interested in making more frame rate out of your frames, that's how you can do it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I wonder how good it will look if you add frames and then slow them back down again. You know what I mean? Then you're looking at each frame for the same length of time while you see artifacts. Yeah. Eh, have you ever really have you ever used DLSS? Uh, I'm familiar on... with it. So I have uh, what do I have? I have a 3000 series. 3000 does DLSS, right? Yes, I think yes. it does DLSS two, but not three. Or I could be right. wrong about that, but yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so yes is the answer. And more importantly, I have looked when the 3000 series NVIDIA cards first came out, I watched a whole bunch of videos evaluating their performance and DLSS. Uh, what's DLSS for those who don't know? Uh, yeah, I, this some NVIDIA term for super sampling that I don't remember the, the dynamic something super sampling, but yeah. it's basically uh, NVIDIA's version of, it, it uses an, my understanding of it is basically uses an AI upscaled 4K and then downscales it again. Right. So like it, so like it upscales and then downscales, but it doesn't take the same amount of effort it would because these cards have uh, processors on them that are better at doing the math right. for those things. So. so that what you can do is you can render the video at 1080p and then basically do AI upscaling to get well, it out, get it to 4K or 2.7K. Yeah, when I say DLSS, that's live stuff. So that's like when no, when no, I, I know live, game. live. Oh, yeah, okay. no, it's rendering your your game, but the yes. the the horsepower required to render at a lower resolution and then upscale, you get a lot of yes. frame rate benefit. And I, I remember when it first came out, there were side by side comparisons, and like sometimes if you really looked, you could see a difference. But for the most yeah. part, under normal operation, you just could not tell a difference. And it's basically just like free frame rate. Yeah, the more you need it, the more you can tell a difference. And the other time you can tell often is with, uh, th there's a special version of it that's actually like adding frames, like similar to this idea. And mm. it doesn't know what a UI is. So it's using AI to decide. So sometimes you'll see where the, you can't read the text on every other frame or it'll start to blur text and thing, you know, cause it's like trying to figure out. Cause it out. can't tell the difference between the graphics and the UI elements. Yeah. And different games have different ways to handle it. And I think you can even layer it out. So you tell it to do this and not do this and stuff like that with it. Interesting. But yeah, you notice that on some, some video games. So I just think that's, it's sort of a similar idea there where sometimes, yeah, you can tell that there's stuff in between and it's like faking it. And sometimes you totally can't. So yeah. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. The future is weird and exciting, but weird. Yes. I've been playing with that AI song generator. Uh, Suno. I wish, if you guys don't know about Suno, is it Suno.ai? Yes. If you guys don't know about Suno.ai, this has nothing to do with FPV. Now we're just shooting the shit, but we'll get back to the news in a second. Suno, S-U-N-O dot A-I is an AI song generator. Blunty. I listened to some of the songs on the top 10 list and on some of them, I, I said to my wife, I said, because you can feed it lyrics that you wrote and it will make a song around the lyrics, or you can give it a prompt and it will write lyrics. Right. And I wish that the songs that were published, they would let you know whether a human wrote the lyrics because I'm having a oh. real crisis. I listened to this song and I said to my wife, if an AI wrote these lyrics, then I just give up any pretense about the special nature of human consciousness. And I need to know. <laughs> I think <laughs> because they were really say, meaningful lyrics. <laughs> that's fair. I think the the weakest part of it for me is lyrics. It feels like you asked chat GPT the lyrics and then it mm -hmm. spits out those lyrics and those are the lyrics it uses, you know, a similar idea. Because mm -hmm. like it just doesn't, uh, yeah, it just doesn't understand. Like every song you try to get it is just like four lines and they either all four rhyme or the first two and the last two rhyme, you know, like yeah. it's the same thing every time you try to get lyrics out of it. So yeah. um, I wish it was a little more creative. You can kind of push it a little bit, but I like the custom generated stuff because you can literally like add effects and things in parentheses and add changes yeah. and sort of like force it to do stuff. So it's a lot of yeah. fun. If you haven't used it, you get free credits when you try it, or maybe they yeah. disabled that because it was 50, so busy. 50 a day sure. is my understanding from when I created a free account. You get five, basically okay. five songs a day. I know I at some point maybe they disabled it because it was so popular. So. Yeah. Um, it's really weird. I had the thought, I had the thought. So you know how back in like the fifties and the sixties, there weren't, everybody was like watching the Beatles or listening to Elvis. There were relatively few uh, genres and relatively few popular musicians or performers within those genres. And then as social media became a thing, we had this sort of fragmentation of popular culture where now there can be this niche band that 500,000 people know around the world, you know, or 50,000 people know around the world. But then there's millions and millions of people who have never heard of them, right? Whereas, like, even people who didn't like the Beatles had heard of the Beatles. They couldn't avoid them. And so this fragmentation happens because of social media and the Internet. And it occurred to me that 
if we get to a point like some of these songs were like it was like oh what if three doors down had ne- had w- was still making music and it was the early 2000s okay i'll just have ai make you a new album of songs in the style of three doors down in the 2000s what if ai could just make media for you instead of an algorithm picking media just making brand new media for you and no one else in the world had ever seen that exact media on the one hand yeah you, you'd be getting something that was tailored exactly for you but on the other hand there would be no social element to it whatsoever and i was like that's yeah, you I don't know. You believe there's no social element. I think it's the same social element there is anyway, because you don't know any of the actors anyway. You don't have any attachment I to any of the people anyway. No, no, no. I don't mean the social element like that. I mean, like, oh. I'll say to my, I'll say to my wife, "Hey, do you see this TikTok?" You would and just send like, that to her, though. No, 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 that's what I'm saying. You would, but you would just share it to the other people, just because it's Taylor Free doesn't mean other people wouldn't like it. You like tons of memes. That's true. It makes you something cool, and then you share it to your friends, and you go this, and then maybe they like it ninety percent because their tailors is hundred percent. But a lot of the know, memes but... my wife sends me, she's I mean, I'm like, yeah, okay, that's cool. I'm glad you shared that with me. It's not for me. Yeah. And like this same. idea, do you remember how right. big Seinfeld was? And everybody Friday morning or whatever morning was after, you'd be talking about Seinfeld I, around the water cooler. I, you don't remember? I that. don't. <laughs> yeah. I'm too young I, well, I, I I barely remember it. I think those yeah. experiences are gone. I don't think we're ever going to get those back. The stratification means like people might be like, hey, did you see this thing on TikTok? And then somebody else is like, I don't know. I'm not getting those memes. Hmm. I don't know. That's a long way away. I don't think it is as long away as you think it is. Because no, it's really far away because the whole fuck out. I don't I don't agree because the reason that things like Netflix and other things are popular is because everybody gets to see them and then talk about them. If you, what if you're you, saying is that there will always be a desire for that social experience. I'm not saying always, but I'm saying in the relative future, like the mm. way this stuff is built is that way, right? Like many people are discussing this in the zeitgeist, and that's yeah. like why it's popular. And that's a big concern people have releasing week to week versus dropping a whole series at once. Yeah, You know, everybody's debating that and which is better and do people keep talking about it? And like, I think that's where a lot of the content is around that stuff, you know? Mm and why mm-hmm. drops on YouTube or stuff don't work as well. And like, yeah, I think there's a lot of mechanics behind all that. I definitely think things are going where you're talking about, but it feels yeah. like we're steps and steps and steps away from that, where we'll slowly lose the social element to that, those things, you know? You know what my wife said? She said, well, then you'll just have to talk about your, your AI generated media with your AI social companion. Yeah. You'll have no no contact with real people anymore. Yeah. For me, that's like even like that's that's where I'm like, I don't care at all about that. Like, I don't think I'll ever care about that. Yeah. No, no. Like, I don't need any contact with people. So like, oh, you you don't not even AI generated fake people. Real people's plenty is what I mean. Like, (laughs) all right. Well, let's get back to the real people who are watching our stream. Uh, okay. Every so often we go off on a little tangent that I think is probably enjoyable. Um, yeah. The next one is our first community spotlight of the day. This is one you uh, brought to the show. Indeed. About about a cool thing on an FPV drone. Yeah, this is a, uh Italian YouTuber. He was actually uh, put on my radar by Fabio Pansera, my, my editor. He actually is a friend of Fabio's, and uh, that's not the only reason. He's here. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to my backyard once again. Today, we have a different kind of... Pro- he does uh, He does cool... Pro- he does regular, you know, product reviews and so forth, but he also does these cool projects that I thought uh, were worth mentioning in a community spotlight. Uh, I chose this one to highlight. He takes a smoke machine or fog machine and puts it on a drone to try to uh, see how that's going to work. Yeah, that's what we're going for. Let's see what we got, though. <laughs> I, I I know what happens. He starts the fog machine. Oh yeah, that's what we're going for. What do you think happens? It all gets sucked into the propellers. <laughs> it's it's uh, useless. It's useless. It's just going straight down. <laughs> so <laughs> so eventually he gets it kind of sort of working uh, by putting a little tube on there to help the uh, the fog get away from the propellers. <laughs> But uh, this is Rimsler, and uh, if you go check out, he's got an Instagram and a YouTube linked in the video description below. Uh, is this content all in English or some of it's Italian? Back to my backyard once. I don't know. It looks like it's mostly in English, so that's good. Uh, 
Everybody want to listen to Italian, I'll tell you what. Um, yeah, there's some cool content out there. So check him out. Um, what's next? Yeah, Next Brandon up, Beans. Gotta... That's that's right. Sorry, Plenty. He did a naked DJI pocket conversion. That's a, yeah. You've seen him. You've seen him around. Go ahead. All right. Next up, we've got our cinematic over the week. Uh, we showed this about a year ago or something. Uh, it was a Giga Berlin fly through where somebody flew through the factory, the Tesla factory, um, in Berlin and showed how all of it worked. Mm -hmm. And that same guy, Ferdinand Wolf, has come back to the Wolf. Tesla factory again. Um, to do another fly through, and we figured we'd share it with you. Yeah, it's cool and I FPV hope FPV stuff. We hope that Tesla will not copy strike us. A Tesla, Elon Musk seems like he'd want us to show this video and not copy strike us. As yeah, long as this is an ad, right? It's an ad. Sometimes yeah. ads get copy struck. Uh, but I'm mostly excited to show off Ferdinand Wolf's excellent work on this fly through. Uh, so let's give it a look. I, I am going to resist playing the audio because audio is a little more likely to get you in trouble, but that's okay. The editing is really nice too. Like the speed ramps and stuff, they really work. Uh, they're not just gratuitous speed ramps for no reason. And I also, it's so fun to me how he flies the drone into areas where you couldn't get, like you can't, you couldn't have a human be here flying in between these giant dies, stamping whatever. Like, yeah, I would really be curious to know how many times he's crashed or like. Sure. Or because there's a lot of these moves that he's doing where he is flying in the process of something. So he it's it feels like he understands where the arm's gonna go for yeah. every arm. And yeah. then he's like planned it out so he can go in under this and over this and if this is here I can go here and stuff like that, you know. Great moves. Just great moves. It's so it's so interesting. Like when I've tried to do stuff like this, and I don't do it a lot. But when I've tried to do stuff like this, a lot of the times it's like, I don't know, I'm just going to – it's like calligraphy. Like you you just – okay, here's a letter. Great. Oh. And then a, a, a calligraphy person comes along and they make the same strokes as you, but somehow they have an artistry and a beauty to them. And some of his moves feel that way. Like, like here he flies under the cars, right? And it's like – that's a really nice move. Why is it nice? I don't know. It just is. It has a kind of a beauty to it. Deciding when to do those moves or how to do them. Like, I don't know. I just flew down the hallway. Ah, it doesn't look good. He does it. Somehow it looks good. I don't know. Really like it. Yeah, if you got it like 130. Yeah. Uh, that's like my favorite part. I just think it's interesting how he like... Uh, and just a second here, he navigates all these arms and he just like, he really has an awareness of where mm -hmm. the arms can go, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. It's just, yeah, I don't know. It's really cool. Good fly. These are the, these are the weakest shots for me. These shots would have been better done with like a uh, Mavic mini and, and, uh, you know, fine. He's do he's doing them with a Cinewhoop. Like the shots where he's just kind of hovering and there's no movement. It's kind of cool. shaky. I think that shot is cool because it's almost like it pulls out and shows you that it's not a Mavic, right? Like, I think that's the idea. Sure. Cool. Very cool. Um, neat factory, no doubt. Neat factory. Can you imagine how much they must clean that place? I mean, Jesus. Oh, It does I not can't. look like a factory, right? I mean, it, I there's mean, like... It's brand like new, wood right? Down the sides of all the assembly places. Yeah, it's just like it's wild how it just seems like a place that's more for looks. I know it's for building stuff, but it also looks like it's really for looks, you know? Yeah, well, I think you were onto something there. Um, it's a beauty. It's a beauty. It's a hell of a place. Uh, anyway, kudos to Ferdinand Wolf uh, for being the pilot who did this. It's a great little fly through, and um, yeah. Mm, cool stuff. Move. Bannister Post said it would have been better without a drone. We're just doing this because we can. Vertical hop is real. Yeah, the vertical. I don't agree at all. You can't. Oh, I don't agree. I think a lot of these shots you couldn't have gotten without a drone. But he yeah. is right that the little vertical wobbles that you can't stabilize out are freaking annoying. He's right about that. I mean, I agree. I think he is. Yeah. Mm. You could easily, 
Well, yeah, you could fly around that by like using a bigger camera and then cropping or something, right? Yep. Or, so. uh, I mean, DJI has that camera with the freaking weird arm that, that stabilizes oh. on the X, Y axis too. Yeah. Oh, he's saying, sorry. He's saying I misunderstood him. He's saying just the shots that where I was like, that's the wrong shot for the, for a Cine whoop. You could have just done oh. those another way. Maybe. Sure. Maybe. I, I just, I was like watching that and saw that side shot we were looking at and was like, oh, that's a, you know, I, this is kind of normal. And then when he goes up, I was like, oh yeah, we're in a drone. Right. It's like, yeah. I don't know. Like it, it's a thing they're doing, I think. And it's kind of neat. So yeah. You need to do it with a robot arm. We got all those robot arms. Let's just put a camera on one. Right. That I would, I am surprised there's not some kind of video like that where each robot passes a camera or something. You know, there's a bunch of things they probably have thought about. So, mm -hmm. all right. Um, okay. No, uh, next up, we got some events. Yes. Events we got that you two. can go to. Yeah. One that you might have already gone to or watched, we wanted to shout out, was the Mayhem Crazy 8 uh, has completed. Mayhem is that 12 hour nonstop racing uh, race that happened. And we wanted to give a congratulations to Team White Goat, who Team has won. White Goat. Um, after 12 hours, oh. they only won by, what is that, 13 laps, 14 laps, 47, 57? Christ. Four, 14 laps. Pretty crazy. 1161 laps was the winning, or is 1147, 1124, 1123. <sighs> The top four were that close. Oh, my so. gosh. Wrecked and Bay Area Racing. How much arguing was there over the lap counts for, between right. third and fourth place, right? Yeah. Over 12 hours, you lost by one lap. Well, are you sure you counted it right? Ah. Yeah, that's that's not uh, – yeah, that seems easy to make a mistake on, but hopefully everybody has the same error rate. So mm. Mm. That's ridiculous. Uh, t the fact that people went and flew for 12 hours is just ridiculous in and of itself. I watched some yeah. of it. I watched some of the live stream and just, it's just astounding. There's so much strategy and I, I, I only know this cause I talk to people who do it. I'm not, I'm not claiming to be an expert, but apparently just being able to fly fast is not how you win this event. It's all about planning. Like, cause every team has like one or two pilots who are like really, really fast and then more pilots who are less fast and um, just by, by, by statistics and probability. And so it's about like when you use those guys, how often you put them in, how fast you wear them out, how much rest they get, and, and so many other things. Um, so just, uh, just crazy. Uh, it was pointed out to me by someone that the team that won was the only team that was 100% analog. No HD0 at all. Yes. Yeah. I did. I did hear that as well. This is also the third year that they've won. Uh, so out of eight years that mayhem has happened, this is the third year they've won. And it was Evan Turner, of course, uh, on Team White Goat, as well as some other people who, who was on Team White Goat. I shouldn't be rude. Wyman, uh, I, just, I believe. Was, There's was a list on the. Was it? I was like, oh, Evan's team. Okay, great. That's all I need to know. I guess that's kind of rude. <laughs> team White Goat. <laughs> Many, many important pilots that I definitely have heard of, including Evan Turner, Alec Lunsford, Dave Myers, Mitchell Bia, Josh Howell, Kyle Kaufman, Neil Marek, Ivan Efimov, yes, Chet Mack. This is interesting to me because um, Evan was the first, I think, to take uh, HD0 to MultiGP Nationals and won that year. And was like, you know, HD zero is the future. HD zero, and I, I, I certainly think he meant it. Um, it's interesting that now he raced analog for this one, and I wonder why. I don't know. Yeah, have to ask him. Yeah, I'm not not sure. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, congratulations to them. And, yeah. Uh, looking for more next year. White goat. Why white goat? What does that mean? Next up, we have do have an event you can go to, and this is a big one for the UK. Okay. Um, so uh, this is FPV Drone Fest uh, UK has been announced for 2024. August 23rd through the 26th of 2024 in Coventry is the next FPV Drone Fest, and tickets will go on sale uh, April uh, 30th, I believe. So, yeah, just uh, be ready to buy those tickets. I believe they sell out pretty fast, and people are uh, – Definitely, I'm pretty excited about this. I got told about this from quite a few different folks. 
Mm. Um, and they all said they enjoyed like going last year. So if you're over there near Coventry and you can go in August, that sounds like a good time. Mm hmm. Yeah. Let's take a look at one of the videos. Drone Fest 2023. I'm intrigued. <laughs> Is it a paintball field? Is that what it looks like? It looks like a paintball field. Interesting. Um, awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'm being told by Chris B in the Discord, white goat is probably uh, the inverse of black sheep. Team white goat, black sheep. Yeah. Makes sense. Thanks, Chris. Fair enough. Didn't put that together myself. Um, all righty. Well, now we come to It's Barely News. But before we do It's Barely News, we're going to read the Super Chats. And we have gotten a couple Super Chats this week. We've gotten right. two of them. The news not big for Super Chats. Curtis Hayes wants to know, do you know what happened to Drone Mesh? His channel is still so relevant two years after his last upload. Uh, no. The short answer is I don't. Uh, he was... Big on YouTube for a while. He always had a lot of other projects going on, it felt like. Uh, and so I've always assumed that he got involved in some other project that took his time. But uh, I don't know what happened to him. Is the short version. Thank you for the donation. Anybody in the chat know what happened to him? Uh, and then our friend Limon, I, uh, Ivan Efimov, uh, also a member of Team White Goat, Betaflight developer, YouTube creator an all-around fun guy. Uh, mayhem is so much fun and teamwork. Who says it's boring? Never done it. I'm sure it's fun to do. I'm not sure I'd want to watch 12 hours of it. I'd need the highlights. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, Simone, for the donation. Um, it's barely news. Short yeah. stories that we don't have a lot to add to, but that we thought you would think were interesting. It's true. Uh, and the first one, I got sent a bunch. This is like the only story people send in this week, pretty much. Uh, other than maybe like a random couple, but uh, I don't know. This they must have really good SEO, or somebody picked this story up. It has the only source is New Atlas that I can find. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of interesting when you see stories like that because often you'll get stories and a bunch of people email them and like eight websites are reported on it. But this mm -hmm. is like everyone was this website, and I don't even know this company, so it's kind of interesting. Anyway. Uh, this drone basically is meant to fly around power lines and do inspection stuff. Mm -hmm. But when it runs low on power or when it's not being used, it just gr goes up and clamps right on a uh, power line. And then this video presents the paper charges from it. Yeah, we can see that so, happening uh, here, hopefully. Yeah, it's based on a paper uh, where they've built sort of a system to do this. So, yeah. And um. Yeah, there you go. Here we can see it happening. It can take off. It can detect the power line. It flies up and latches right onto it and recharges its battery. I guess, I mean, it's only latching onto one wire, so it can't have like a, a ground circuit going through it. It must be like inductively, yeah. you know, parasitically whatever energy from the magnetic field surrounding the wire. But... It's a pretty big yeah, freaking field, I'm guessing, and you probably draw a fair amount of energy from it. Uh, whatever, 40 watts? It's getting 45, 50 watts? 50 watts? Wow. Just sucking 50 watts from the magnetic field around the wire. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Sounds I like free could... energy to me. Yeah, we've seen uh, drones before where they... Um... Like they're built to go on the wires, you know, mm -hmm. sort of basically drone style things. But yeah, I yeah. thought this was neat because it can actually latch and unlatch. So it would be really good for any kind of inspection drone that's near power lines. And I mean, yeah. a lot of drones are near power lines. So if you could get licensed to do this or allowed to do this with different companies and systems, like, I mean, boy, that'd I feel be like uh, nice. I think what I'm hearing is that if I just get one of those long fiber last poles in a hook, I can just like get free energy off the power lines. Yeah, you don't even need fiberglass pole, like because it's all radiant under the power lines. I've seen people do that before. Yeah, if I if I was I was hoping you were gonna say, please don't put a, a wire on a power line. You'll kill yourself. No. Well, 
If if you that's a Darwin thing, man. <laughs> yeah, don't don't do that. Don't do that. That's that's like a come on. Yeah, just stand under the power line with a coil and pick up free energy. Um, nice. Uh, very cool. Very cool. All right. Uh, Next up, China has approved an e VTOL for production. As far as I know, this is the first full production e VTOL in existence. We've seen a bunch of them get approved, so they can be legally flown, and people have made them. But this is the first one that has been approved for mass uh, production and use in uh, China. So that's kind of interesting. Six months ago, this got the type certification in China. So it was like, you know, it's usable and it's okay. You know, they've deemed it safe enough to use or whatever, but now they've got a production certificate to start pumping these things out. So I would imagine the next six to 12 months, you're going to see a bunch of air taxis showing up in China uh, and whether or not they'll be useful, whether they'll crash, whether they'll take over, who knows, but um, this is the thing that's happening. So, yeah, very cool. There's a question yeah. in the chat from Lead Chicken who wants to know if it, using that drone reduces the energy that's being delivered over the lines. No, but it does increase the energy that needs to be produced at the source in order to keep the uh, frequency uh, consistent. So the way uh, AC mains power systems work is they try to keep the electricity at 60 hertz. If the load increases, then the, the frequency starts to drop and then the generators have to, you know, ramp up to bring the frequency back up. And if the load decreases, then the frequency increases and they slow them down. And so what they're actually manipulating is the frequency and that's proportional to the amount of power that's being used. So when that drone lands on that line and starts charging up, it causes a microscopic decrease in the frequency on the line, which then means the generators have to work slightly harder in order to uh, in, in order to uh, keep the frequency. The bottom line is that the people at the end of the line still get just as much power as they ever would have, but the they have to use more energy. If you're drawing 50 watts off the line, that 50 watts has to come from somewhere. That's the bottom line. Mm, continue. All right. Uh, next up, uh, in the rounding out the end of the news here, we've got two more stories uh, about our favorite topic, which is drones rescuing dogs. Yeah. Heat seeking. I don't like heat seeking. That's the wrong. That's the wrong phrase. Heat seeking drone finds dog. Wait, no, no. <laughs> it doesn't sound right. Oh, and did they have another doggo to help greet it? I can't tell. This is a, uh, yeah, this there is a, um, they were stuck in a bunch of uh, branches and thickets and brambles uh, oh, for, yeah. for, 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 for days and they couldn't find him. So oh, they were able to locate man. him with a thermal drone, which is pretty crazy. You know, well, it's it just wasn't so, even that far in there. Yeah. It's just wild how um, you can really do a lot with a thermal drone. So. Yeah. I'll say again, if you have one, please help Oh, my out gosh, look at that area. face. Yeah. Nice. Sorry, I cut you off because the dog. No, you're fine. Cute. Um, and then we'll look at the other story, the second story we have, which is another dog being rescued. Uh, this is pretty cool. This is, this is like a little over the top. It's another one of these, you know, it's like a reality show sort of thing, but it's more, mm -hmm. it's between reality show and real. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. overhyped real stuff, mm -hmm. but this does show them um, showing up. This dog had been lost for quite a few hours and they showed up and basically within 12 minutes, he was able to, from getting there, was able to launch, mm -hmm. fly around and find the dog, locate the dog to go rescue it within 12 minutes. Uh, a, it's really just great thing. crazy what a thermal drone can do, you know? Yeah. I learned from, from last week's show uh, that this, uh, black and white with red is a common thing that thermal cameras do. And the red is basically just the hottest areas, just to sort of highlight the hottest areas. So it's not like anything special. Um, but it sort of makes sense. If you've got a, a living creature, it's probably going to be hotter than ambient, and it will probably tend to stand out in that way. 
Yeah, something he talks about in this video is there's it's all people will often say like, oh, this only works well at night or when it's cooler. So it has a difference for the body or, um, you know, things like that, you know, can be much more difficult in the light. But um, he shows in this video, you know, him going through a lot of the process and within 12 minutes can locate the signature for the dog, which uh, and it's broad daylight out. So, yeah, I think it It'd is be pretty very interesting. Be very interesting to, to watch the whole video and learn about his process for searching. You know, like where he searches, what stuff he focuses yeah. on. Like here, he's he's found this little dot, and this is presumably the dog. But like, how did he know to like see that little dot? Right. And why did he focus on that little dot? But there's a lot of little dots down there. Is my point. <laughs> how did he know that one was the dog? I don't know. Yeah, I think he gets quite a few of them that aren't correct. But part of it is like in 12 minutes, he can go over how many of these things that aren't right, and, you know, and Here narrow down the search and things like yeah. that. So they, um, you know, I will also say we've shared before, but there's Lost Dogs uh, SAR uh, yeah. in the UK. And I bet if you contact them, they've got a program or a process for like searching areas and how you would handle this and what the best, most efficient processes are. Cause they've saved, I believe thousands of dogs at this point. So mm. look at that poor boy just sitting there. Just like, I don't know. I hope somebody finds me. It's just given up. Oh my goodness. Oh, all right. And we have to, we have to find the moment where they find the dog. Oh, it's in the trees, dude. All right. We're going out to find the dog. Oh, yeah. All right, now we're doing the reality TV thing where we, okay, we talk and we recap and we recap and we talk. That's something. That's really something. It's just sitting there. How many, it makes, it's sad. It makes me think how many pets have been lost and they were, you know, 800 yards from their home just in a thicket somewhere yeah. and we're like i don't know it's just my life now and they were never recovered you know sad yeah. <gasps> there we go there we go oh yeah there we go oh my god look at that that is a chunker of a dog oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is a chunker of a dog oh yeah oh yeah no the dog that was stuck in the bushes for five days when he hears the other dog got rescued in 12 minutes. Nice meme. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ghost Bridge, for the meme. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. All righty, guys. Well, that is going to bring us to the end of the uh, news this week. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, we got yeah. one more super chat. Squirrely, thank you for a five dollar super chat. There was a guy who was arrested in Philly, I think, not Bot Grinder, who was flying drugs into prisons, making it bad for us. Forgot to send the story. Well, uh, to be honest with you, Squirrely, I mean, obviously submit it if you think it's interesting. But I got to be honest with you, a drone dropping drugs into a prison is so common as to almost not be newsworthy in and of itself. Around uh, here, we call that Wednesday. <laughs> right. Right. Um. Um. Yeah, that's gonna do it. All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, down at the bottom, don't forget, over there, you can news at fpvknowitall.com. Only corner. I can point at it. People ask all the time, where's the email? And it's right over there. So uh, use it and send in news. If you've got news, we'd like to know about it. Any events, we'll share them. Any projects, we'll share them. Any cool cinematic stuff, we might share it, depending on what we've got other available for cinematics. So mm -hmm. send it in. We'd like to see it. All yeah, right. absolutely. Bye-bye, uh, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.